Thank you, Bonnie, for sharing that word with us. And thank you to Nancy and Kathy for bringing us uh, a beautiful piece of special music this morning. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you again for this beautiful day, for this time of gathering, this place that we refer to as a church building, to allow us to come and just to be able to be together. Make us more fully aware of your presence, O oh God. Fill us not only with your love and grace and your peace and your joy, but Lord, just bring to us this message in a way, O oh God, that we just don't hear it with our ears, but write it upon our hearts and our minds. As we hear these words, follow me. So bless now the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts. May they be acceptable into thy sight. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage of scripture is kind of an interesting passage because we find that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And we know if we go back and, and we look at the timeline of the story, we know that Jesus is now entering into his final days. And this passage of scripture says that they entered into a Samaritan village, but they weren't welcomed there. I know we're not told why, we don't know the reason, but I wonder if the story is less about what happened there and more about the disciples as their response to what's happening in the story of Jesus and his journey as he makes his way to Jerusalem. Their response that comes in this story seems to be an indication of some resistance to the message of Christ. We understand that James and John become somewhat upset when they're not welcomed in this village. And, and in fact, they, they want to destroy the village. The New Revised Standard, the New International Version, Jesus rebukes them, okay? The Common English Bible says that Jesus sternly speaks to them and Eugene Peterson's message, Jesus' response is, of course not. You know, they wanted to have this kind of reaction to what happened in the village, and yet Jesus is saying, let's just move on. And so that's what they do. But you know, even in our own lives, sometimes we are not very receptive to the message that Christ has for us. Sometimes Christ calls us to do something, you know, whether to be uh, about a particular ministry or to, to do something within the church or in the community. And sometimes we're not very responsive simply because it interrupts our way of thinking or our way of doing. A friend of mine once told me that they like their religion. In fact, the individual said to me, I like my religion, don't mess with it. Sometimes we get so entrenched in our way of doing that we miss what Christ calls us to do. And so they continue on. They move beyond this village. They move on. And so as they do, you can't help but think that as they're walking, they're kind of talking amongst themselves, either as a, as a group, as a whole, maybe just one or two or threes, but they're trying to process, process and maybe digest not only what happened in the village, but the continual being in the presence of Jesus. It wasn't some 30 verses ago that Jesus tells of his return to Jerusalem, and he even describes the events that would take place. He told them of his suffering. He told them of his death. And this was still weighing very heavy on their minds. But as they're kind of sifting through all of this, one of the disciples speaks up and addresses Jesus and says, I will follow you wherever you go. Now that's a pretty bold statement. That's a statement that by making that statement, it really is a statement about commitment. And so when we think about this disciple making this kind of commitment, that wherever you go, Wherever you go, I will follow. Think about that in our own lives. What does that say about our commitment? 
Are they merely words? Are there actions that would show and prove that it was a commitment? But you see, in all of this, Jesus, he knew what was going to happen in those last days. He knew how he would be abandoned, denied, and disassociated. And so this journey for Jesus, as he walked this road and as they're moving in the direction of Jerusalem, was a difficult one. But even in our own lives, the journeys that we are called to walk sometimes can be a difficult one. You know, early in our Christian lives, we, we focus on, on, on learning more about the scripture, learning more about the church, what it means to be a child of God. But as our faith grows and it begins to take root and deepen, it merges with our lives in the world. That is that we realize that living in and with Christ is more than just simply a private matter. You know, no matter what our gifts or our imperfections are, we, as we mature as Christians, we realize that we must walk alongside of Christ. But the journey, sometimes being difficult, compels us to make difficult choices, even when the world tells us differently. Sometimes as Christians, we we have to make choices that aren't popular choices, that sometimes seem contrary to what the world would tell us. And as a result, we know as Christians, we will be resisted and rejected, sometimes more than we will be received. But remember this, Christ made a commitment. There were times when he could have turned around and went in the opposite direction of Jerusalem, just like Jonah did, tried to run away from and not going to Nineveh. But Christ made a commitment. He knew the plan. He knew what the will of the Father was. Even in the garden, the night of his betrayal, he was saying, well, take this cup from me now, because he knew the suffering. He knew what it was that he had to go through but he knew what he must do. And so he made a commitment to each of us. That commitment was to go to a cross, to be nailed, suffer, and then his death. And so when we are struggling with what we're being asked to do, just as these disciples on the road, as they, as they were told to move on from this village, that there was something that happened there. As they were moving on towards Jerusalem, to these final days of Jesus being here on this earth. When they were struggling with what to do, Jesus simply said to them, as he says to each of us, he says simply, follow me. In order for us to hear those words and to respond, it means, and a question literally, are we willing to make a commitment? Not, not just for today. You see, when Jesus called the first disciples, I believe that when he walked along that shore and he called those first disciples, they thought they were just gonna go do something for the afternoon. They didn't realize that when they responded to Jesus say, come and follow me, that it was something that would be a lifetime. And when we commit our lives to Christ by accepting him, making him the center of our lives, it's not just a commitment for a few hours, but rather it becomes a commitment of a lifetime. And not just a piece or a segment of our life, but our entire beings. But we struggle. We struggle. Many of us, if not all of us, are, willing, are not willing to make that commitment of whole life. Every part of our being committed to Christ. Now, why? Well, first of all, I think it's the fear. First of all, it's the fear of rejection. Okay? Because in order to make that commitment, it means that there will be things that, that we may have to sacrifice of time and energy, resources, things that may not make us feel good, things that don't make us look good. And maybe the question is, what will my friends think of me if I were to do this? So there's the fear of rejection. 
But there's also the fear of change. So many times as human beings, we get stuck in a rut, doing the same thing over and over and over. I think I've shared with you before, but I know in the mornings when I get up and I get into the bathroom, I have this routine of, of the things that I do and the order that they are. And if I get something out of order, I just gotta stop and think where I'm at. And sometimes I just have, well, we get stuck in these ruts. Sometimes we think about, well, it's the way that we've always done things. But if we look around and we keep doing the same thing over and over and over, does it invite new people? Does it involve inviting new people? Does it grow our church? As human beings, we don't like change. That, that is one of the most fearful words that we have in our vocabulary because it means we have to try something new, something different. And many times as individuals, as human beings, we're not open to new ideas. So we have the fear of rejection, the fear of change, but there's always the future of the unknown or the fear of the unknown, which is the fear of the future. Again, like change, trying new things, we don't always know how people will respond. Maybe it will attract people that we don't want to attract, not people like, not like us. But it's also that fear of the unknown because we can't control our destiny. And like last week, we talked about a helper. We talked about the Holy Spirit, how that Holy Spirit helps us to understand scripture and to understand the purpose and meaning of our lives, sometimes the fear of unknown keeps us from being open to that Holy Spirit and where the Holy Spirit might take us. At the end of this passage, Jesus says, verse 62, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Are we dwelling in the past? Are we dwelling in the future, looking with anticipation, with some excitement about what God is doing and what God will do in our lives, in our lives together as this body of Christ. You see, our path is identified by the things that we treasure, all right? I've always said, if you look, look at those things that occupy your time, your energy, your resources, they will tell you what has become the passions, your passions in life. They reflect the priorities we set. They reflect the way that we treat others. But it also represents the excuses that we make sometimes that keep us from being the hands and feet of Christ as we are called to be. Sometimes it is that this fear of the unknown is we do make excuses simply because Committing our lives to Christ means that we may have to go in a different direction. But what Jesus offers us is an opportunity to follow him on a journey of faith. But the Christian journey, hear this from me, the Christian journey does not man, demand that we reject our responsibilities to families or vocation, but rather encourages us to see those needs in the light of our faith and through the lens of our deepening commitment to Christ. Catch that? It's not shirking on our responsibilities to family and vocation, but rather seeing things in a light that reflects our faith and the deepening commitment that we continually are encouraged to make in following Christ. So can we follow Christ? Can you follow Christ? Can I follow Christ? Can we begin to demonstrate, that is, can we live daily our commitment to Christ? And with God's help, the Holy Spirit, can we overcome our fears? Can we commit to Christ our lives? So maybe in the light of this story, as we think about the disciples and what they're struggling with, and this whole scene, maybe the question that we should ask about our own lives, is it about us or is it about Christ? He simply says, follow me. 
when Peter was getting out of the boat. He said to Jesus, if it's you, then tell me to come. And Jesus said, come. He invited those who became disciples by simply saying, come, follow me. It is a simple invitation, but it isn't easy by any means. It comes with much work and much effort. But the reward is heavenly. There's a song called I Will Follow. Chris Tomlin writes this. And the chorus is, where you go, I'll go where you stay. I'll, it says, where I go, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good, all your ways are sure, and I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight, high above my life, I will trust you alone, trust in you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you move, I'll move, I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. In this life I lose, I will follow you. I will follow you. And the song continues on, just in that same theme. The disciple said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Are we there? Are we able to make that commitment? And if not, then what would it take for us to get to that place? Jesus simply says, come, follow me. What are we willing to do to make that commitment and to follow him with all of our life, with all of our being? To do whatever it is that he calls us to do, even when it isn't popular, but to know that we are called to be the hands and feet of Christ in our world today. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the words of Jesus that come to us, simple words to simply follow me. Jesus issues that invitation. Sometimes it is a difficult one to respond to with all of the chaos and the challenges, all the distractions in our world today. And yet it is a simple invitation to commit our lives to serving Christ. So Lord, challenge us with these words in ways that, that help us to, to think about our commitment and, and perhaps to, to increase our commitment. In baby steps, a little by little, moving towards that full commitment in Christ. Help us, O oh God, to be all that we can be, all that you've created us to be. Christians who are following Christ, filled with love and compassion, with grace and forgiveness. So speak to us this day, O oh God. But we, add, we thank you for these words and we thank you for your blessing. For it is that Christ has committed his life to us through the death and resurrection on the cross. And for you, O oh God, it is that you have loved us with everything. You have given your one and only Son. And we thank you, O oh God, for what you do and for the ways that you continue to love us and encourage us and to move us forward. So help us to hear these words when Jesus says, follow me. For all this we ask in Christ's name, amen.